So can you guys, like, how do we do this where I can actually uh, just see Raj and not all the rest of you guys? I don't know, that, I guess. We'll, that, we'll that, that is a question beyond my skill level. I think, okay. I don't know if you, we'll figure it out. I think you, I think you could spotlight him, so. Okay. Uh, all right, everyone. Well, welcome today. Uh, it's a privilege to be here today, and we're excited to talk a little bit more about uh, how to scale a billion dollar startup. And so uh, I'm going to be your podcast host and your webinar host. And I just want to tell you a couple things before we get into today's session. So uh, today's uh, guest is Raj Singh. He's going to talk about how he took two startups from uh, zero to a very large company that's now publicly traded. And then Todd is going to be your uh, your interviewer today. But before I turn things over to Todd, I want to couple, uh, cover a couple uh, webinar housekeeping items. First, you'll be on mute during the presentation, but you can ask questions about our speakers uh, in chat, and I'll be responding to those at the end. Um, also, this event is hosted by Wildfire Labs. Wildfire is an accelerator that helps founders take an idea and turn it into a software product with revenue in six months. Uh, if you're on the webinar today and you have an idea that you want to turn into a business, you can get in touch with us directly, and I'm actually going to be posting our uh, application link into chat. So before uh, we uh, cover any more other things. Let's turn it over to you, Todd, and you can get started. So go ahead, Todd. Okay. Well, thanks, Mike. I appreciate it. Uh, Raj, I appreciate you coming. I mean, just do a quick background uh, on kind of uh, your, you know, your history a little bit. Uh, Raj is the CEO and chairman of the board of Accolade, a publicly traded company. Um, Raj joined as CEO in 2015 and then took the public, uh, the company public in 2020, and has integrated over four companies with over a billion dollars in acquisitions. Um, prior to that, Raj and I worked together at Concur. He was the co-founder of uh, Concur with his brother, Steve and Mike Hilton. Uh, and it's a travel and expense management company. Uh, in, two, in 1998, uh, Concur went public um, and uh, had almost over $800 million, 4,000 uh, employees and 20,000 customers. And it was acquired uh, in 2014 for $8.3 billion by SAP. Uh, Raj was the president, COO, and uh, member of the board of directors. So welcome, Raj. It's uh, good to see you, and I appreciate you taking the time. Uh, it's always good to see you, Todd. It's been too long, man. It's been too long. It has been a long, it has been a long time. So why don't we dive in here a little bit? Um, to me, it's uh, interesting. You've had this joke with me before where you said, for a guy who's had three jobs, uh, things have worked out pretty well for you. Uh, so you had a job right out of college. <laughs> then you basically started Concur and took it to $8.3 billion. Uh, then you became the CEO of a, another company, Take That Public. Um, so maybe your resume is thin, but you've done pretty well. Congratulations. It's thin. <laughs> it, it's thin for sure, Todd. And uh <laughs> And I think the people at Ford Motor Company, back then it was just called Ford Motor Company, would tell you uh, it was probably a good idea that I leave there. So <laughs> of the two, uh, one, actually, I, I worked with you at Concur, and obviously that's worked well. And uh, and uh, Accolade, we're in the journey, man. We're in the journey. We took the company public back in 2020, and we're bouncing around in the public markets. It's a tough time to be in the public markets, but we're battling, and we're trying to do uh, really great things for human beings uh, in the universe of healthcare in the United States, which is a tough place to work, but uh, we're going to keep battling until we build something great. Well, that's good. That's great. So maybe talk a little bit about like, did you kind of envision this is what you were going to be doing? I mean, from an entrepreneurship standpoint, right? You went to school for to be an engineer. You, like you said, you were at Ford. Uh, but like, how did you end up going from, you know, I, I, the story about you taking the summer off, you were looking at being a lawyer, but like, was entrepreneurship uh, either something that was modeled to you kind of early on? Or was this something that basically you just kind of grew into? I think of it as anti-modeling, Todd, in some way, shape, or form. Okay. <laughs> and I say that I say that in like the the most complimentary possible way. My dad is an Indian immigrant uh, who came to the United States. He had three kids. He brought over his two brothers, so he had like it's like he had five kids that he had to support. And uh, he didn't have the luxury of entrepreneurship. He could take no risk. He worked at one yeah. place. He worked at Eaton Corporation for thirty years, and you could see him chafe at being told what to do when he, I think, tangibly, I, I think Steve would attest, my brother Steve, for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about with Todd, uh, my brother Steve would attest, my dad is far smarter than any of his kids, uh, far more ambitious than any of his kids, and far more capable than any of his kids. Uh, but he had a battle of his own. He had to take care of a family. He didn't have a right. He didn't have the opportunity. And so 
we watched that. All of us watched it. And all of us turned out to be entrepreneurs in some way, shape, or form. And I think in some ways, it's a, it's a tribute to my mom and dad. That's cool. That's a cool story. And I think, you know, the anti-modeling is is a good one. Um, I think you know, my dad has some of that too. I mean, I think uh, they had a young family um, and didn't have a lot of education, had to provide. Um, and I think if you asked him what to do over with, he, he'd have some very concrete ideas exactly. of what he'd like to do differently. Yeah, and so I think that is good. So maybe just like talking about, um, maybe talk a little bit about your jump from uh, Ford to Concur, right? You were in your 20s um, and, you know, you basically had an opportunity to, you were thinking about going to law school um, and, you know, and then you kind of basically did a little bit of work for your brother on this kind of expense management space and and then, you know, you took a took a chance. Um, and so what, what about like that uh, opportunity and um, the risk taking, you know, maybe your dad had given you some of that idea but like that was the first time you really got to test it kind of in a professional environment. Yeah, uh, probably the first modeling of risk taking was my brother, Steve. Uh, he went off and started his own company right out. You know, he dropped out of college to go do it, which really pissed my parents off. <laughs> and uh, and then and then I got the job at Ford. This is later. My brother's seven years older than me. And my dad was like kind of happy. He's like, you got a job. You went to engineering school so you could get a job. And I, within nine months, I quit that job. I actually didn't call my dad and tell him for two weeks. I was scared <laughs> to tell my dad that I quit. <laughs> I was really scared. I'm probably more scared of my mom. So I didn't, uh, but I knew that wasn't for me. I knew I couldn't do that. And I got lucky that Steve and Mike called and said, we're going to go start this company, Concur at the time, it's called something different. And you're unemployed. You're not going to law school for six months. Why don't you make yourself useful? Like, you know, build a prototype, do something useful. And you know what I found, Todd? What I found uh, when I moved out to the West Coast, and I, this is uh, in no way, shape, or form. I think the world has changed pretty dramatically. But back then, the the technology infrastructure and the technology mindset that existed on the West Coast didn't exist in Michigan. Now, I just think that that's totally different in 2024 than it was in 1993, yeah. uh, much like it's different in South Dakota than it was in 1993. And so our view... Uh, is, is very much that like when I got out there, I met a bunch of people who were like, I'm going to change the world. And I was like, wow, I, I, you're 23 like me and you think you're going to change the world. Maybe I can do that. And uh, and that led to sticking with it. I never went to law school. I stuck it out with Mike and Steve and we did it together for 21 years. That That was by happenstance at some level. But I think the world was kind of pushing me in that direction. When I quit at Ford, I knew I was never going back to a company with 100,000 plus employees. I was a number and I wasn't a very good number, yep. you know? Well, that's good. Maybe talk to me a little bit about like just that inflection point where it's like, it's one thing to take a take a risk and basically do kind of the summer job and see it coming together um, with, you know, like Hilton. But it's another thing to realize that like this is, you're onto something big, right? And so was there a moment um, kind of in that journey where you kind of saw, hey man, this is not just like, hey, I've gotten a job and I'm going to paycheck, but this is something that like is really has the potential to scale and have a material impact in the business world. Yeah, it took me a minute for that one, Todd. Probably the first sure. like yeah. year, the first year, I was, I was just in love with uh, making decisions that were going to impact a product that people were going to use. You know, like, and so it sounds really dumb now, but yeah, uh, I would sit there. I was in a room with Mike Hilton. I was in our my apartment with Mike, and we would work there all day, and we'd play video games all night, and the the. You know, there'd be moments where I'd be like, hey, you know, I think the interface should look like this. And I think it, this is the way an expense report process should flow. And I'd look at Mike, ex you know, expecting somebody to give me input. He'd be like, I, I guess you're right. Like, do it. And I realized like, oh, shit, I get to make these decisions. I get to decide. And then we shipped a product a year later and people used it and liked it. And man, I was I was hooked. I was just hooked on the idea. Like, I built this shit. Uh, and, it's, and it's good. And it could be better. And uh, I fell in love with that. Before I realized that this could scale, I never, for a minute, for a long time, it took me a long time before I believed, oh, this is an $8.3 billion company, whatever. Uh, I just love the idea of building stuff. And, uh, and I think anytime I get away from that in my career, Todd, anytime I get away from building stuff and the, the love of the building process, I get in trouble. 
And so, but it kind of wrapped up in that, I guess what I heard you say was some ownership, right? Some autonomy um, to basically test out some theories and basically, you know, go do what you said you're going to do. So I get the build process it, but I, th I think either as my entrepreneur and, and working for you at Concur, having that ownership component to take a risk and see how it works out, I think was a big part of that. Amen. Amen. I mean, isn't it, it it's, it's incredibly empowering to know that you own a decision that could tangibly move a business. I think when people think yep. about why they love their job, I don't care whether they're starting a company or not starting a company, they talk about their boss, uh, they talk about impact. Uh, you know, yep. am, am I actually moving the needle on something? Uh, oftentimes compensation is not even like the top three, four. Totally it's, agree. it's way more about the people they work with and can they have an impact on something that's important. And I think that was, a, that's addictive. It's addictive. And I think if you create a culture where people feel like they have that in their work, they get addicted as well. Yeah. Okay, well, let's let's um so the the theme of this is is really thinking about like, is there some patterns in the way that you thought about scaling concur and accolade that we can kind of leverage from a startup perspective? And so I took a swag at some of the things that I think we were good at at concur. Um, and I think these are elements that you can basically scale all the way down to a, a two, three, five person company, all the way up to you know having multiple thousands of people. Um, the scale of each one of them probably changes a little bit, but I do think um, these are elements that make sense. And so I, the, the four that we came up with were vision, uh, culture, execution, and people development. So I'd like to spend a little bit of time in mm. each one of these, but I really think that these are some of the core elements that I think I felt like really were solid at Concur. Um, and I think that even as I'm working with entrepreneurs, I kind of talk about these things in just a smaller scale. And so um, do you, any comments on that? Do you think those are core elements that you think that you've leveraged kind of consistently? Yeah, I think those four are, yeah, those are the right four, Todd. I think uh, the ex exploding each of those, uh, yeah. I think uh, vision and culture are required for execution. Execution is a son of a gun. Even when you have vision and culture, like execution yep. turns out to be really, really hard. Uh, and and uh, and people develop the same story. So like, I think two of them are like sort of foundational building blocks. You got to have them. And then once you have them, that's like a ticket to the game. And the game turns out to be really tough. There's a lot of major league baseball players out there throwing throwing hard fastballs at you every day. And so, uh, but yes, I agree with the four, but. Okay, sounds good. So let's go, let's start with the vision piece of it. Um, I think that every entrepreneur that starts is basically saying, I want to change somebody's behavior. I want to change the world, right? And so um, mm. even from the very smallest start, I think they're thinking about thought leadership. They're thinking about like the process works like this today. I'd like to change it for like this tomorrow. And I think over the history of Concur, you guys did this very, very consistently, right? Whether it was going from a uh, shrink wrap product to an on-premise to a uh, SaaS you know, environment to integrated travel and expense to a platform play to uh, the perfect trip, right? Like there were a bunch of pivots where I think in general, what you were trying to do was say, where should this industry really be? Not where we're at today and where we're competing, but where do we think it's supposed to go? And then how do we lead an industry to get there? And what I thought was really interesting, and, and I, maybe at the time I didn't always appreciate it, was basically lots of people were trying to play catch up, right? And the number of bets that were right over that 21, period, 21 years that you get, did that was actually pretty remarkable. Um, and so let me just stop there and see if that resonates with you. Do you agree with that? Um, I think it was something that basically uh, was a differentiator and became a moat for us over time. I think you're right, Todd. I think um, I think there's a there is a there's an innate sort of human instinct in there that it, that you can have or you maybe you don't have, which is growth. Like I got to grow. We got to keep growing. Uh, and you could put that in the context of commerce and public markets. Your growth rate better keep stay high. Therefore, you better find new problems to solve no matter what you do. You could put it in the context of human behavior. Like, if we can do that, why can't we do this next thing? Why can't we do the next thing? Uh, and I think uh, I, I like to think we were pretty good at it. We certainly made some bad bets over the over time, and those bad bets uh, knocked us in the head a, couple, a few more than a few times. But I think where we when we got really good at it, Todd, is like you're supposed to grow because you have a vision for the problem you're trying to solve. And uh, and when you're really good at it, you're really close to your customer. You understand your customer's needs really well. 
and you can anticipate the next need, right? Uh, if you just do what your customer tells you, you usually don't solve the problem. But if you understand your customer really well and you can you keep anticipating what their next need is, you might you have a chance to build something pretty remarkable. But you better be talking to customers a hell of a lot if you're going to paint a vision that's going to keep growing every day. So a couple of things in that that I think are good. One of them is, um, I think maybe just to use different nom nomenclature, um, you're expanding your TAM, right? You started off with kind of Bingo. like a focused area, and then basically this total addressable market over time just continued to get bigger and bigger. And so the market opportunity for your product and your services just got bigger and bigger. So I think that's one where I think that's really important. And I think especially for young entrepreneurs, you start off with a beachhead. You start off with something that's super specific that you're trying to solve the customer problem, and then you're trying to expand to take on more and more opportunity. Um, and so that's good. The second piece to it, which I think really resonates is focus on the customer, man. The, the more you do that, the closer you get to like the problem. How much of the time, though, um, do you think that the customer understood where to go, right? Like a lot of times they're talking about the problems um, and the change management to get them to do something totally new and innovative sometimes is a challenge. And, and like you got, you know, behavior that they're kind of, this is the way I've always done it. And so if you just made it incrementally a little bit better versus shifting entirely uh, to a new paradigm. So how do you lead a customer through that process with a vision like that? Uh, yeah, there's times where a customer is just going to tell you the wrong data. When uh, Todd, you'll go back, I don't know, it must be 15 years ago now. Uh, we were leading the expense reporting category. We decided we were going to add travel and that online travel booking. Logically, every online travel booking ends up on an expense report. Therefore, the two, pro the two processes should be tied together. Every one of our customers said, well, yeah, no, that's the travel agency's job. They have a travel booking tool. We're never going to use yours. You're not the travel agency. Uh, if we if you had surveyed 100 customers about uh, putting those two things together, uh, you would have got 95 of them saying, no, 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 we're never going to buy that from you. And we just knew that was intuitively, that didn't make any sense. And so like you can hear it and then you can look at the business problem and you can look at the universe the way it's supposed to be and say like, okay, we don't agree with you. We're going to buy it. By the way, we'll come up with a unique pricing model that makes it really enticing for you to want to buy it from us. Uh, by the way, we're going to make it a really cool tech stack, and we're going to partner with all of those uh, travel agencies that you're worried about. Uh, so we solved the problems that the customer perceived, but we didn't let the customer talk us out of something that mattered. But you had to, you did have to go back, Todd. Like the things that they said, I need my travel agency partnered with you. I need it to work in the following five ways to deal with, you know, uh, policy issues and duty of care responsibilities. And those were things we didn't know. So like we got a lot out of those customer conversations, but we ignored the big point, which is you shouldn't do this at all. Yeah, so I think that's pretty cool. I mean, it's uh, it's there's some nuance to it, right? You listen to your customer, and then you got to basically you know ferret through the forest to figure out how to get there, right? And and bring them along Bingo. for the journey, right? Because otherwise, they'll come, they, you know, that's right, ooh. that's right. They'll come along, Todd. They'll come along, right? Yeah. Like they like you, uh, we you and I witnessed it together. Uh, as long as you say like, hey, I disagreed with you on this. This is why we did it. But here's the five things we agreed on. And I did those things. People want to be heard, man. And by the way, building innovation and technology is really hard. And most customers know that. Yep. And so if they feel like they've got the ear of somebody who can keep moving them forward in the technology game, uh, they know that's worth money and yeah. that's worth that's worth value. Good. Well, that's good. So let's talk about culture next. Um, I do think this was a key foundational issue at Concur. And it's like, I got hired, uh, I think in 97. Um, and, you know, I probably went through, I don't know, seven. Those eight, were lean years. That's why, those were lean years. Lean that's why we years. had to, that's, we had to get Gagney. <laughs> we thought, oh man, we got to get this kid from South Dakota. Do you remember yeah, like no, you no, had no. a guy named Lanny who did like the industrial uh, like uh, interview <laughs> at the end? And so oh my I God, remember, those like, are the worst. Those are the worst. Well, I it was interesting though, Raj. The part that was cool to me that I can't keep focusing on was you basically built a profile on you and a handful of other people have said, this is the type of culture we want, um, or these are the type of people that we want with certain characteristics. And then you hired like an industrial psychologist, essentially, to yeah. basically at the end of all of these meetings, like all these interviews to say, does this individual actually meet to like the criteria that we had? And so I know that's not the start. I mean, that's a start of like understanding culture and starting to say there are attributes that we value in this. Um, and this is a method to do it. Maybe it wasn't the long-term method for us. It didn't scale, but it was just interesting to say you were pretty, um, pretty 
prescriptive on what you thought were aspects of the culture and the types of individuals that you needed to have. And then you blew it out into a culture that we could hire against and a set of core values that we rewarded that I think helped scale and bring on people in a unified way. Yeah, yeah, I, I, Todd, I think uh, I think writing good, to great changed our lives at Concur. Yep, uh, yep. That 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 book fundamentally changed our lives, and uh, and I, I I never hesitate to say that. I think Jim Collins wrote down a bunch of things that we knew in, intuitively to be true, but then he gave us a lexicon and a framework that we could hand out to every employee in the company and say like, hey, we believe that. And so yep. if you ever question like what it is we're thinking about, go read that book again. And uh, a part of that was writing down core values. Uh, we've done the same thing at Accolade, uh, and it's it's just a constant framework. I open every one of my exec staff meetings. One of my exec team members will pull one of our six core values at Accolade and say, like, this week, here's my theme. Here's why, you know, whether it's be fearless or relentless execution or uh, embrace reality, whatever those 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 are. They become a part of the vernacular of the business. They become a framework, a, a reference point to say, well, this is one of those moments. We got to embrace reality. And what that does is it just sort of weaves together when you're interviewing people, when you're firing people, unfortunately, uh, you're re referring to that framework and saying, do these people fit? You know, there was a there was a moment at Concur and I'm, I'm still working towards it in many respects at Accolade. And so if anybody from Accolade listens to this, that's not a criticism. That's that's an aspiration uh, where people would interview at Concur and they might interview seven different people and they'd be like, man, you guys sound a lot alike. Uh, and it wasn't because we were from the same place and because we had the same vision or the same view of like a particular challenge. It was we talked about the problems we were trying to solve and the way we wanted to go solve them in very, very similar ways. Uh, aspirationally, when your company gets to scale, you should feel that way. Uh, there shouldn't be much. There shouldn't be much uh, dissonance in the way we, in the way you talk about what you're trying to solve. And that, to me, culture is uh, is the only way to build something great. Last point, Todd, because uh, I know I'm rambling on. The culture doesn't have to be like Amazon's culture is fundamentally different than the culture we had at Concur, or fundamentally different than the culture we had at Accolade. It's fundamentally different than the culture that, that you, know, you have at Microsoft. The, there is no such thing as good or bad per se. You you just got to choose it and be consistent and you're going to get what you choose. So, uh, you know, I've kind of gone through this with a couple of startups over time uh, doing it. And what what's interesting to me is they go through the exercise, but they don't operationalize it nearly as well as maybe we did, or like, or it's a challenge, right? It's a it's a set of of things that you put up on the wall, uh, but it's not like how do you take it from an exercise of documenting it to an exercise of we live it every single day, right? And so there's there's things about rewarding the behavior, calling out bad behavior. Um, but I think, you know, as startups go from this where it's like it's really founder led, right? A lot of the culture is defined by the first founders. Yeah. And then basically they publish some things and say, this is how we're going to hire because they're not involved in every hiring decision. But then sometimes there's an atrophy or like we just don't live it as consistently because it doesn't get enforced. Do you have any ideas like how how do you make that transition from a body of exercise that you do to publishing some things to then living it? Yeah, first thing is don't bullshit yourself about what you really believe. Like some people will write down their core values, and it's not really their core values. It's just what they think. Like treat people with respect. It's but, you know, like, it, what, what, Correct. It's like so write down what you really believe, even your imperfections. Uh, like the company is, as a founder, the company is gonna build around the way you behave. Uh, and if there's dissonance between what you write down about what you believe and the way you actually behave, it will work against you in the worst possible way. It'll be insidious because people will realize, oh, this guy writes down shit that he doesn't really believe, but I can watch him in action. Uh, and therefore, there's a gap between the truth and 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 behavior that that uh, that is probably admissible or permissible from the rest of the business as well. That's a bad thing. That's first. Second, uh, it has to be in the hiring process. Uh, and the hiring process, uh, even later at scale, has to be pretty uh, significant. It's true at Accolade for me right now, and it was true certainly I concur. People used to complain of like, God, I had to talk to a lot of people before I got that job. 
and it was one of the big complaints we had at Concur is like, your hiring process is a huge pain in the ass. And I almost gave up on it because I had to talk to another three people. Uh, I think that's okay. Like go slow, uh, but insist on a uh, a cross functional team interviewing important, particularly important roles, uh, knowing that the that culture is going to c- come out in every one of those areas. Uh, the I think the the second part of that story beyond hiring is promotions. Uh, you know as well as I do is, but by the time you get to 100 employees, people who manage 10 people, 15 people, 20 people. Uh, are massive culture carriers for your business. And so you promote you promote somebody who's going to manage 10 or 15 people and they're countercultural in any way, shape, or form, they are going to kill you. They are going to kill your business. They can make their numbers, but they are just going to, they're going to be, that's going to be cutting underneath what you believe in every single day and you won't even know what's happening. But the 10 or 15 people below are going to blame you for the fact that you have you promoted that person. And so making making director even senior manager promotions, cross-functional in nature, that says you can't just promote that person. You got to go get three cross-functional peers in a room uh, to agree that this is the, this is a person to get promoted. Like those things protect your culture. And those are just a couple examples in my mind. Uh, that's good, Rush. That, that's important. Um, you got to live. You got to live it, um, and you got to basically um, embrace the culture. And I think all of your managers need to uh, promote good behavior. And then stamp out bad behavior. It's part of your job, and and I think that's that I it, I think that's what helped us. So maybe the next one I have is uh, really talking about execution. Um, again, I think uh, we did a relatively good job of executing at Concur, and I think it boiled down to a couple of different things for me. One of them was the priorities of the exec staff were relatively clean. Um, so you knew kind of what we're going to do, and we could basically bring down to the next level of people um, that we're trying to execute a list of deliverables that needed to happen. Um, and there was ownership. There was somebody that owned a problem, and basically they were their responsibility. And and then there was kind of a trickle down of, of that. And so as the business got more complex, that became harder to do because there was conflict. But I think early on, especially with startups, the more you can execute well, there's so many things and there's so much noise and there's so many distractions, but good startups. And I think in a lot of cases, we did this well, kind of post 2000, we stayed focused. We understood what we were trying to go do. And we, um, and we put priority, we put priorities on like what was important to us. And then we had teams and people that basically were rewarded for execution. And so I don't know if you agree with all that Raj, but like, man, I think me and growing up in that culture, I felt like at the end of the day, I was paid to execute, right? That was that was that was how I made my paycheck, right? If I delivered on what you asked mm. me to go do, that was the most important thing. Yeah, and I agree with that, Todd. I think I, you're a good example in my mind of uh, your career just kept growing because we we did think about things in the context of what problem are we trying to solve, and then you would find your biggest problems and and. You know, I've said this a couple of times at Accolade, actually, Todd. Like, we should get Gagney to do this, and people would remind me that it, you don't actually work for us. And so that always doesn't work out well for me. We never really get that problem solved. But the, uh, but we would we would find the biggest problems. We'd be like, hey, let's get Trevor, let's get Trevor Davenport, let's get Todd Gagney, let's go get them, and let's move them out of what they're doing. Let's hand them the responsibilities to make decisions. Let's get out of their way. Let's check in on them every 30 days. But let's go. And the priorities were very clear. I, everything you said, I, I, I think, makes a ton of sense. The one thing I would add to it, Todd, is, is we, were, we were flat from the beginning to the end, uh, meaning at $850 million in revenues uh, before we sold to SAP, uh, I had 12 or 13 direct reports. And almost every like organizational person who would come in and review that when they'd meet with us, when we were doing hiring and we'd bring in exec recruiters, they'd be like, when are you going to fix that? And I'm like, I don't think that's a bug. I think that's a feature. Like, I think that's what uh, that's the way it's supposed to work. Uh, and we were lucky uh, in, in many respects in that, uh, you know, we had Steve who was sort of on the outside uh, looking outside and I was on the inside looking inside. But uh but that the flatness of staying close to the business, not having too many layers between you and a customer, not having too many layers between 
uh, you and the biggest problems, and therefore not having as many layers between you and your superstars. Not every superstar is going to report to the president or CEO of the company, but you better damn well know who they are because when you got a hard problem, you got you got to find that person and say, dude, here's the problem, here's the context of the business, why I need you to go do it. Uh, and when you have a, a, a deep enough bench to go do that work, man, you can do some damage. Yeah, I think it's all good. I, I think that makes sense. How how do you preserve kind of that founder mentality? Like, I felt like I was an owner in the business, and I felt like every time I had a problem, it was my problem to go solve, right? And so there was a high degree mm. of ownership in that. And it's like, how do you go from, you know, like your small startup and you continue to scale that and you and it's not about a job, right? Like, I, I think as soon as like you're kind of punching the clock, you kind of lose some of that. You don't take it personally anymore. And so what is it that like you preserved through that process that you're trying to recreate that starts out really small where you basically all kind of had that mentality and you're trying to scale it? Yeah, that's probably the hardest question of all right there. Like, how do you maintain a hunger and a thirst uh, that's not entirely compensation driven. Uh, you know, Todd, when you joined in 97, uh, we went public in 98, the stock went to hell in 2000, 2001, and the stock was in hell for four or five years, or three or four years at least. Uh, if you were working at Concur during that time period to make a million dollars, you were probably delusional, right? Like it was, there was no, it was no, concept of like, don't worry, this $2 stock is going to be a $129 stock one day. Uh, it was under you did a dollar. Work. <laughs> <laughs> correct, correct. And so you did the work because you were passionate about the work, you were passionate about the company, you were passionate about your peers, you were passionate about your customers. And uh, I, I think this particular problem is harder in 2024 than it was in 2000. Uh, the universe moves faster, data flows faster, people change jobs more often. Uh, there was a time, Todd, in 2005, 2006, if, if I looked at your resume and you had three jobs in the last four years, I just wouldn't interview you. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's, that's a lot harder to do today because the majority of candidates you're talking to have spanned a number of jobs over the course of the last four or five years. And so uh, how do you maintain it? I think you reward performance, uh, you reward culture, you uh, you get very, very, very focused on uh, on the people who are consistently making the best cultural decisions about the problems they're seeking to solve and solving. Uh, and that's really hard to do, man. That's really, really hard to do. And so I think the best piece of advice I can give you as a founder is – uh, before you start creating layers in your business, you better know that the people below you have the same core values, behave the same way as owners, and, and have the capacity with their span of control to actually pass on those values. And so uh, if they don't, uh, you will slowly but surely kill your business. And, and that's there's a reason why most companies don't get to that scale is because that that's the insidious thing from within that kills you. Okay, that makes sense. I, I guess this kind of goes to the next one, which is really people development, right? It's one thing to have those kind of cultural values, uh, that kind of ownership mentality, but you know, going from you know, I don't know what it was like when when I started, it was relatively small, and we went all the way to five thousand people or whatever. The job was different every year for me, right? I mean, and I and yeah. I think. What I was kind of always joke on was, you know, 50% of it's going to be different. I just don't know which 50%, right? And so, you know, you kind of had to evolve. And so this idea of people development, once you have kind of the cultural alignment, once you have a strong degree of ownership, how do you take somebody and scale them from, you know, like a small startup and how far they can go, right? And that that starts with like the CEOs, right? Like I, I work with a lot of st small startups and like the guy that basically is doing everything at the very beginning to the guy that's now leading a $10 million company that's trying to take it to $20 million, that's a very different CEO. And that trickles down to every single person in the organization that wants to scale. And so to me, this is really a fundamental problem. If you can basically help your high performance talent continue to scale up, then basically your ability to execute and, and win in that space, I think becomes a lot great, a higher percentage of opportunity for you. But it's hard, right? It's super hard. And so maybe just talk a little bit about that. And and do you kind of agree, like, like what, what are the characteristics for you personally going from, you know, where you started to your job at the end? Like you are a totally different manager 
over that period of time. Mm. 100%. I, I, I believe, and I, I, I'd, I'd be curious about your perspective on this as well, is that um, there's a growth mindset, learning mindset that exists in great leadership where you're constantly looking around the corner, not just about like what's the next trend in your industry, like to put that one to the side. It's like, what are the next set of skills I need to grow in order to continue to advance who I am as a human, not to get the next promotion, but to just advance, like as a leader, as a manager, as a father, uh, you know, as a husband, whatever it might be. And that growth mindset in part translates to the people who you're working with every day. Uh, because as you as you expand your desire to go try new things and to go learn new things, for me, in 1993, when I joined Concur, or when we started Concur, uh, if you'd have asked me to read a balance sheet and a p and I'd have been like, well, I can't do that. I just couldn't do that. And, uh, I, you know, I'd taken one accounting class in, in engineering school and maybe a couple business classes. Uh, if you asked me in 2015, when I started as the CEO at Accolade, uh, to map out the healthcare supply chain and explain to you where every dollar was spent, why it was spent that way, and the Persian Bazaar manner in which it's managed across the universe, uh, I wouldn't have been able to do it for you. But uh, the the mentality of it's learnable, I'm growable, I'm going to learn it, and I'm going to study like a son of a bitch until I understand it, and then I'm going to pass that understanding on to every single person. Like as a leader, you recognize that once you know it, all, you, all that really happened is now you know something. When everybody knows it and everybody understands your perspective and everybody understands the problem you're trying to solve based on that perspective, you're cooking with gas. Getting everybody to that page, uh, and, and by the way, in 2024, harder because not everyone's in the office sitting right next to you, uh, is the mission. And whether that's uh, what you learned about the industry, what you learned about management, and about leadership, what you learned about culture and values, as a leader, passing that on to everybody underneath you and, and building some common rapport or framework or vernacular or structure associated with that, I think is mission critical to growing the people underneath you and them doing the same below you. Uh, I, I think last point on that, Todd, in my mind is, is that uh, that translates in both good and bad. You know, one of the things I say uh, all the time at Accolade and at Concur was like the, the bad news should travel fast. And so if I got bad news, like the first people I was going to, I was not, there was no way, not, not a day I was going to hide that data. I was going to go talk to the people above me and the people below me. Everyone was going to know uh, because I needed their brilliance to solve the problem. And uh, so good news, bad news and growth has to travel fast, which is like a constant communication and learning vehicle. But if your leader doesn't have it, if your CEO doesn't have it, if, you're, if, if your leadership doesn't have it, uh, your company's slowly dying. Yeah, I, I think it's good. I think one of the things that maybe you didn't mention that I would challenge a little bit is um, is just a culture of, of a failure, right? Like it's okay to fail if you're trying to do mm. what's right from a cultural value standpoint. And you learn from it, right? Like we had this kind of thing where it was like, I think there was a risk tolerance in our business where you could take some chances if it aligned with what was good for the customer, what was good for our business. Um, and, you know, sometimes you're not going to nail it, right? But if we allowed you to do that sure. and create that like ownership mentality, I agree with you, this like intellectual curiosity of continue to learn, continue to grow, continue to find new things. But there was like an element of, um, it's okay to take risk in this business because you're going to be rewarded if it works out. And basically, you're going to learn something if you don't. And I do think that that's part of uh, like a uniqueness that we had that really did allow people to grow because we were moving fast. And like you're not micromanaging any of these people, right? You're you're giving them autonomy to continue to figure things out. Do you agree with that, or like I, would you spin it I, I differently? Do. I do. I no, I think it's right, Todd. I think that your degrees of freedom grow as the business grows, right? And so you can take more risk and you can grow. Uh, I remember uh, a moment with in your career where uh, you were managing clients and you flipped and we, we said like, hey, like Todd's going to be a, one of the people to run this company one day. Uh, we need to grow him in sales and marketing. Let's make him that a marketing. 
Uh, and there was probably like a whole bunch of salespeople who were like, what in the hell are you doing? Like that guy's never run marketing before in his life. Uh, and then you went and crushed it. And like, was the risk, did the risk exist that uh, you were going to go fall flat on your face? Yeah. And I, honestly, the conversations that we were having about you in that moment, Todd, were uh, if he falls flat on his face, will he get so discouraged that he leaves? Because that would be devastating to the company. Or will he be the kind of guy who's like, thank you for the opportunity. Now, what, it, what, what do I do next? And we were pretty confident. Like we wouldn't have made that. We wouldn't have done it if we thought you would have punted if, if things got tough. Uh, but that was a, a, a great example where like, boy, it, it, if you couldn't do that job, it turns out you could, uh, you, you were going to impact the number of the company, like the revenue line of the company of a public company uh, that year. Like you were going to have, that was going to have an impact. And, uh, and that was risk we took because we were thinking about growing people, about people development and about this idea of uh, the more breadth of skills that people had who really understood our business problem, the more we could achieve. So, uh, and I'm super thankful of that. I mean, I think literally you just said, don't screw up this one You would, and I'll give you the next one, right? You do, you knock it out of the park. I think I'll I might have used, I think yeah. I might've used different words and don't screw up, but yes. Yes, you did. Yeah, you did. But <laughs> I guess one of the things that's interesting to me, and I think we, we ended up having this at Concur and I've seen it in other companies is, how long can generalists uh, survive leading new things, right? Before the company decides, hey, look, I need a marketing guy who's basically going to, that's got 20 years of doing this, and I'm going to put that guy in there and I'm going to bring him from the outside. And so each startup, yeah. I think, has this thing where it's like saying, how do I grow them from inside? And how do, what is what is the benefits to doing that versus the downside? And then there's some inflection point where I think a lot of companies say, I, I don't do that anymore. And I think by the time I left, there were a lot of frustrated, talented people in Concur that basically were not moving their careers forward. And they didn't, they, the, the paths that I had from a generalist standpoint just weren't nearly as available as they used to be. Mm. I think that's true, Todd. I think, I think it does happen. Uh, I think the critical element of that is in many ways, how close is the management team to the top talented people in the business? Uh, and as, as you get to that kind of scale, you've got to have things like talent reviews. You have to have an understanding of like, who are you investing in and making sure you create growth for them? And that gets harder and harder to do. But I think you also do have, uh, there are different elements. Like you begin to grow into different spaces. Uh, you know, if you, if you were to think about, uh, marketing as a challenge, uh, when you're trying to grow 25% off of a hundred million, you got to generate $25 million worth of new business every single year, presuming you retain 100% of your customers. When you're trying to grow 100% off, or 25% off of a billion, you got to find $250 million worth of new opportunity across the universe in multiple markets. Uh, and some of that shit, you just need somebody who's seen it before. And, yep. and figuring out when you max out and you're like, we have tried everything and we don't know how to solve this problem. Uh, is with with the with the brain power we have internally is a trick it can't be all of the jobs uh, and especially it can't be in my mind it can't be engineering and product like engineering and product you got to grow inside you got to find really talented people to add to the mix but the vision of the product and the vision of the infrastructure and the vision of the tech the, the tech stack you damn well better own that forever the, the rest of it, though, you got to find scale in, in a number of different spots. Okay. I mean, that, that that's a good one. I just see, I think some people do it too early where they start pulling in and saying, you know, I, I'm growing, you know, maybe I'm not even to $10 million and I need to go find the expert that's going to go do this. And I oh, think what I wouldn't do what, that. What I, I yeah, I wouldn't that. either. And I think like, I think they look at it and saying, I just don't understand this. And so it's a black box to them. Right. And so I think they don't understand their business well enough. And so they're outsourcing the solution to somebody who looks like on paper, they've had it. And I think what you're really trying to say is, no, you, you got to a understand this problem inside and out. And then you need to put talented people that can help you grow to it. And I think doing this internally for as long as you can is, is a good strategy. Oh, I couldn't agree more, Tom. I a hundred percent agree. Like, if you're an engineer and you don't understand lead generation and pipeline development and deal closure and forecasting, well, then you better fucking figure it out. Like, you're not going to build anything if half of the business you decide, like, I don't care about that. I'm just going to build stuff. Uh, 
Although, you know, there are there are product led growth strategies that say you can just build product and not worry about it. But you got to choose a strategy that allows you. There is every part of revenue generation is a part of your job if you're building a company, every part of it, which is customer retention, customer acquisition, all of it. If you don't understand those metrics cold up until hell, 150 to 250 million in revs, if you don't know those those to a T, you're not going to build anything you uh, particularly good. Yeah, that's good. Okay, we're going to go to like the rapid fire round. So I just got a couple of quick questions for you. I'm curious on some of your feedback. So uh, I know you're uh, you know, intellectually curious, you read. Uh, is there a good uh, couple of books that you recommend to founders or people that are uh, kind of going through that entrepreneurial journey? Uh, well, well, I mentioned Good to Great. That's, I think that's awesome. I, I love uh, uh, Andreessen Horowitz is an investor in Accolade. Uh, uh, Ben's books uh, are, I think, awesome. Uh, I'm a big biography, autobiography guy, Todd. Like, I just love reading people's stories. I just finished, probably three months ago, I finished the Musk biography from Walter Isaacson. Isaacson's, any of his biographies, I think, are spectacular. Mm-hmm. His his books on on uh, the world's innovators, like, how I think Stephen Johnson wrote a book called How We Got to Now. Uh, those are all amazing. Uh one of the things I ask every candidate I interview is, what are you reading right now? Or what are you listening to right now? And if people strong, st- uh, stumble on that answer, I think, oh, you're probably not curious enough for me. But those are the ones, t- to me, like uh, just constantly reading about the struggle of others and the challenges they went through. Like, we finished that Musk book at some point, and it's like, <laughs> there was a day where Tesla was about to go out of business and SpaceX was go- about to go out of business, business. Like, within like 48 hours. Yeah. Uh, and I, I think of the pressure I face sometimes uh, as I walk into my earnings calls and I think, yeah, it's not as bad as he had that day. <laughs> so I'll be fine. So maybe uh, unpeel that a little bit. Do you look at it from a pattern matching standpoint? Do you look at like experiences, like uh, ways that they dealt with it, uh, you know, parallels from different industries and how that can apply to you? Like, you know, reading biographies is great, but like I always think um, it's not always a uh, one-to-one match because it's a point in time uh, that they're actually in. And so abstracting that to kind of your current problems, you have to be kind of careful to kind of basically apply it. But it, it does kind of make you think differently because there's a, most of the problems and most of the things that people have gone through, they're, they, they're, they're already happened, right? And so you're not really going yes. through anything unique. And so is, is it really the pattern matching or is it something else you're drawing from those bios? I think it's. I think at some level it's pattern matching, Todd. Um, I do think most often, when at least in my history, in my experience, uh, when companies I've been responsible for owning or running are hitting bumps in the road, I can always trace back to: Have we lost sight of the customer, and have we lost sight of the product and the technology that we're building? And, uh, and if that's true for whatever reason, because, you know, I've been doing Accolade for nine years now and 21 years that concur, I can always trace it back to some bad decision I made that I got to go back and go untangle and understand and figure out where the challenge is. And so, uh, I think you find that in a lot of different stories, like it's always about going back to your roots. And the question is sort of like, how do you identify that problem faster? How do you see it faster? Uh, and how do you get there faster? And I just learn, I, I learn by, the, we get so wrapped up in our shit, Todd. Like there are times, you know, I've been doing this for 30 plus years now, and I still get wrapped up in my own stuff. And reading about somebody else's problems or listening to like the acquired podcast and listening to the the the, ta- the 30 year story of Bernard Arnault and Elvia Mage, I listen and I think, oh, damn it. I know I, <laughs> I know I just screwed something up that I shouldn't have screwed up. And so you, you never stop making mistakes, unfortunately. And so the other people's stories just help me see my mistakes. Yeah. Well, that's good. I love reading. I love learning. So that I just wanted to d- double click on that one. Maybe talk to me a little bit about um, 
what do you think, like, maybe list out a handful of, like, key skills as a founder? So you've gone through this, you and, and now, like, in hindsight, what would you say, like, are some of the key attributes that you would look for in, in a startup or, like, a startup founder um, as they're kind of going on their journey and starting at the beginning? Culture building first. Um, clear understanding of the of the customer's business problem. Like vision is a tough one, Todd. Like, so I, I would say like a clear understanding of the customer's business problem. That's where you start. Like the vision of like how this thing is going to be a giant business one day, that'll come over time. But if you know the core problem you're trying to solve and you know your customer exceptionally well, I'm really interested in the problem you're trying to solve, uh, especially if it's a big problem. And so culture building, can this person convey a sense of how we want to go about doing things and that's the right thing? Second, do they understand the customer and the customer problem? Uh, third, are they a good human being? Uh, are they somebody that I would want to hang around with and spend time with? Uh, you know, there's there's plenty of people who are really compelling founders who can paint a vision and can uh, and can uh, can outline a culture. Uh, but if they're not really good human beings, they won't build a great business. I think over time, uh, by and large, there's going to be some exceptions to that rule. Uh, and I think that the last one for me is uh, is someone who uh, has a has a genuine. Uh, a genuine empathy for uh, the others around them, like a responsibility set. Uh, founders should own the responsibility, should own the failures and the successes of their business, and uh, and should have an empathy for the people that they're built that are coming around them. Like the 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 in- interesting first 10, 20 employees of a company, they're not founders, but they're as close as you can get, and you're going to be demanding of them things that are unnatural and. Uh, and you better be compelling as a human being to 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 inspire them to want to do that work. Yeah, those are really good. Um, it's hard to get that stuff right, right out of the gate, right? You got to spend some time with the individual to kind of figure out how much of that they have. Um, we see a ton of uh, entrepreneurs coming through our program and stuff and candidates. And so we're always trying to sharpen, like, mm-hmm. what is it that we're really looking for? And how do you identify it as quickly as possible? Uh, is there any kind of overrated? Go ahead. Sorry. Don't you? One of the things that I always I, I I would love, and I'm sure you guys do it, but to beat out of the startup ecosystem is this bullshit about I'm crushing it, we're killing it, it's amazing. You know, I, when I talk to founders who are early in their journey and they tell me how awesome things are and how incredible they are, I know they're lying. Yeah, uh, they have to be, and <laughs> yeah, they have to be, and and so. Like retiring that narrative, like I got to fake it till I make it uh, is instead of like, I'm just grinding through and I'm crushing problems and I'm doing it as fast as I can. And I know uh, this is hard. Like it is really hard, especially when you're talking to other founders. Just be honest. Tell the truth. Uh, and obviously, you don't want to get in front of your customers and say, I'm dying. Like I'm, I'm, I'm struggling every day. But uh, acknowledging that this is a hard journey and uh, that there's honor in the uh, in the honesty of acknowledging that difficulty and then calling on uh, people like you guys at Wildfire to help them with that. That's that's that would be really valuable to the whole ecosystem. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I think it's it's totally true. And I guess we try to do that in some sort of well way because we we see them like multiple times. And so es- essentially when they come to us, we try to give them some more work to go do. And basically there's different touch points and saying, how well did you actually do that? And like, and do you take coaching well? Um, you know, how well did you execute on that? And so you try to get a snapshot of how well are they kind of going through this process with you even before they come into the program. Um, and so, you know, you try to get people that are pretty humble and can be honest honest about where they're at uh, because it, it's, a, it's a difficult road. It really is. Is there any overrated um, like startup advice? You, you talked about like kind of the narrative that we have today, and I completely agree with you. Is there any other stuff that you think is kind of uh, overrated from an advice standpoint that is, is, is a narrative in the startup community that basically we need to unravel? Uh, I don't think you need to know what your company is going to be 10 years from now on day one. And uh, you can paint a picture. You're probably going to be wrong. Feel comfortable painting the picture that's going to be wrong, but don't expect that you're going to know that. And don't pretend like you do know it uh, when you're talking to smart investors. That's one. Two, uh, uh, I think people have a, a false perception that uh, that to be a great founder, you have to have this enormous charisma and everybody wants to hang around and be around you. That's all bullshit. Uh, leadership comes in like a thousand different forms. 
whatever you are as a leader, that's what you need to be. You need to embrace that authentically and be that human being. You'll find the right people to surround you if you've got a big enough problem and you've got a good answer for that problem. Uh, but uh, the the sort of hard charging, charismatic CEO who knows everything, that person doesn't exist. Don't try to be that person. Those would be the yeah. two. Okay, that's good. Maybe the last question I got for you, Raj, is if you had to go back and, and talk to you or give advice to your younger self, let's say that you're uh, you know starting out and doing concur in your 20s, um, what you've learned today, what would you impart back to that individual you know back then? Uh, I would tell myself to slow down. Uh, I still have a hard time slowing down. And so uh, Sometimes, and this is maybe a unique advice to me, but I don't know. I don't know. I, I'll give you my introspective view. Uh, I'm in such a rush once I see a problem to solve a problem that uh, that sometimes I, I run right past an easy answer because I'm just like, we got to go. I got to get on to the next one. Uh, so slow down would be one. Uh, two, uh, if you don't know the answer, it's in the product somewhere. It's in the customer problem somewhere. Uh, stop looking in other places and go, go solve the core, the root problem. Those two. Uh, those are two mistakes I've made a lot over the course of the last 25, 30 years. Okay, well, that's good. Um, Raj, I, I appreciate you taking the time, brother. This is uh, this has been great. Um, as you can tell, I have a lot of affinity to my time at Concur and working with you. Um, it really me shaped too, me professionally. It really shaped me professionally. And, and you gave me an opportunity to do some pretty incredible things, jobs that I had no uh, responsibility or no um, credence in doing that you gave me an opportunity. And so it's been fun. And it's cool to rehash these, right? And I do think there is some framework and some principles that, we, that you really drove at Concur that you can apply to these startups as they scale. Um, and I think a lot of the work that I do with the teams is direct result of, of the experiences I had with you and, and the rest of the team concur so thank you i love the fact that you're doing this work brother i love the fact that you're doing this work and uh always good to see your face man Hope yeah fam's good yeah you too well thanks a lot raj i appreciate you taking the time and uh and mike is there any do we, is there any questions we got a couple of minutes left we we got probably time for one or two uh at okay. most so uh the first one is how do you walk alongside top performers when they're just struggling hard mm. Uh, I think you're telling the truth. I think the best leaders tell the truth and the struggling hard part of that story is, uh, in, in part, like you have to understand why they're struggling. And so the only way you can understand why they're struggling is, is not trying to pretend like they're going to be fine. It's going to be okay. Uh, a lot of founders are really shitty at providing rapid feedback that says people are failing. Start there, uh, and you'll figure out what's breaking. Right. Uh, and then what is one painful leadership lesson that you had to learn early on? We'll, we'll close with that one. Because I think uh, back to your point about being authentic and not painting this picture, it's painful being yeah. a founder and it's painful to scale when you're growing. Uh, yeah. If you don't invest in actually, like you, we did a lot of just throwing people into the deep end and we did a lot with Todd and he, he, he swam, uh, he swam to shore every time, but, uh, I think over time, what I learned is just constantly just throwing people into the deep end of the pool. Like you're going to drown some people, and uh, and investing a little bit and helping them understand how to grow, especially as you scale. Um, as a founder, you you've jumped into the deep end and you expect everyone to just be able to figure it out the same way. That's a that's a flawed assumption. All right. Well, that's our time today. Raj, thank you so much. It was fun. Yeah, uh, I learned fun it was It's fun to hear about your journey. And for those of you who are founders on here today, there's some really great leadership lessons that'll help you to grow. So thanks again for joining uh, this morning. I put a link in the chat. If there's something that resonated with you and you're interested in scaling your startup, consider applying. And uh, Todd and Raj, thanks for your time today. Have a great day, everyone. Bye. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Sounds good. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.